For those who uh, were here when I presented before, you know that I'm a big fan of Harry Potter. And um, I've always presented myself when I talk to you on medical legal things as the wizard in the room, and you, just the muggles. <laughs> this morning, I was humbled, despite my neurosurgical experience yesterday. Excellent. I was very humbled this morning to be in a room with amazing wizards, grandmasters, uh, and very inspiring talks in terms of what you're doing to make this world a better place. Um, globally, and I think the work that you've begun is going to have tremendous ripple effects uh, for generations to come. So my hat is off to each of you, um, and I know many who were not involved in the talks were inspired enough to kind of come up and say, I want in. I mean, I did neurosurgery yesterday. I can do it in another country. <laughs> I just need a little mentoring. Right? A robot. A robot. A robot. Um, I also want to start by just thanking Dr. Wones. Um, I think the metaphor that I would use is that, from what I'm hearing and what I know, is that you are the spoon that stirs the soup. All right. Yeah. And everybody else is peas and carrots. Michi and Linda, we wouldn't be here. We can't do what we do without the help, uh, the infrastructure of making things happen. So thank you for that. And Dr. Manisa, two thank yous. One for being my mentor last night in neurosurgery. I think you said to me that after that screw was so perfectly placed that I can skip my eight-year fellowship and go right into practice. So um, I'm ready to go. Okay. And also, uh, as we were breaking at about 11.05, realizing that there was no ideal witness for me, which would have been some neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon who had never testified in a deposition or trial that I can just kind of have up here and we can work together and they can feel like they have now expert tendencies. Um, so I caught you on the way out the door and you promised you would be here almost at three o'clock and it worked. So thank you for being here. That's a big, big, big thing. Snow is a little deeper than mm -hmm. I thought. <laughs> so we're going to start, um, we're going to try to accomplish a lot in a short period of time. One thing that we're going to do right now, phase one, is I'm going to meet with my client's orthopedic surgeon uh, to get them ready for the deposition that is going to take place by the attorney representing the insurance company for the at-fault driver in the case hypothetical. Okay? So this is a friendly meeting. No ties are needed, obviously. Um, <laughs> Uh, you could go skiing before you meet with me. You can do all those things. It's just supposed to be an informal meeting. Uh, it's supposed to bring the blood pressure down. Uh, I understand that in this universe, I'm the wizard and he's the muggle. But I'm a nice wizard and so I'm going to kind of coach him up into wizardry language and thinking so that when he sits down with the dark forces of the insurance company trying to trick him into words and wordsmithing, he'll understand what's going on and be able to put up shields up and he'll be able to kind of deflect that and, and, and talk in a way that he is really a wizard as opposed to just a muggle. Um, so we're going to start with just meeting. Hey, we've not met before. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Pleasure's mine. Yeah. And um, thank you for meeting with me. I know this is probably not your ideal thing to do during the day. You probably prefer to spend time in a clinic or in the OR taking care of folks. But um, Jack, you know, speaks so highly of you, and he wanted me to make sure that uh, uh, you knew that you have helped him in ways he cannot ever say thank you enough. Uh, his pain is down. His function is up. Uh, he's enjoying life again in ways he hadn't done before. So It's he, nice to hear, and I appreciate your efforts on his behalf. As you're aware, I... You know, it's my first time doing a deposition. I'm not that experienced about it, so I appreciate you taking some time with me to talk me through it. Can everybody hear on the mic? Oh, good. Okay. Um, so, you know, the depositions come in next week, and I, you know, I've learned over time that it's just always a good idea to preparation always prevents poor performance. So I'm going to try to encourage you as best I can to do what you would do to prepare as if you're going into the OR. Um, 
uh, and I'm not sure what your standard of care or practice is before you go into the OR, but here, because it's a kind of a different environment just to spend some time, you're welcome to take notes as we're talking, and um, you're welcome to tape record this if you want to hear it, play it back, whatever works for you. Um, if we do well, we being you, me, Jack, and all that, uh, and if you're prepared, you're going to do well, you should own the room. You know more about what's going on than any insurance attorney could ever possibly know about anatomy, physiology, and so don't get, don't get too psyched up and um, don't get your blood pressure up because it's a foreign environment. You're in control, and I'm going to give you some tips to keep you in control. Um, and if you're in control, uh, likely the case is going to resolve. And the, the good thing here is you spend a couple hours in this process of a deposition, you're going to save yourself eight to ten hours with respect to trial preparation, driving to the courthouse, sitting outside. The judge says, oh, we're done for today, and I'm going to go do something else. And so the preparation and the deposition is a nice way to end it all. So put a little extra spice and prep, prep time on that. I also want to remind you that I'm paying for your time today. You're not a volunteer. So whatever a reasonable charge is with a small r, reasonable uh -huh. charge, we're totally good with that. Uh, but I also want to remind you that when the deposition occurs, being requested by the at-fault party's insurance company, you also charge a reasonable charge to them because they're requesting your time. And that could be with a capital R. <laughs> <laughs> That's between you and me, okay? okay? Before we get into some general stuff, I uh, just wanted to see if you had any questions, that anything you're concerned about, you want to talk about, or... Anything I should know that, that you think about? or? Well, I think that the, since this is my first deposition, I, uh, I have some concerns about the kind of questions they're going to ask me. Are they going to ask me questions about myself and my training, <clears throat> any cases other than this? Or are they going to ask me to make statements uh, of opinion? Um, what, what is the nature of the questions that they're going to ask me? And, and can you help me avoid uh, putting my foot in my mouth? Um, I'll try. Um, we'll go through some general things I think they're going to ask you, and then I'm more concerned about the specifics, because if somebody says, where'd you go to school, I'm pretty sure you know that answer, whether you're a wizard or a muggle. I'm pretty sure you know the year. I'm pretty sure you know where you did your residency and fellowship and how many surgeries you've done and what your specialty is and what articles you've written and present. You bring your CV. So when they start going on those questions, you can say, would you like a copy of my CV? Give it to them, okay? Yeah. And, um, and those kind of general questions, you know, give me your background, all that stuff. My role there is I can't, like, stand up in front of you as Superman and say, hey, leave them alone. Um, they're allowed to ask you any question that not is relevant. That's a trial. It has to be relevant to go in trial. But they can ask you any question that may lead to relevant information. So the patient's history, anything you know about the patient, anything in your file, there may be something in there that leads to relevant stuff, and that's a decision that gets made later. Now, so, you know, on TV, uh, when they do these things, there's always this objection. You, you recognize me from TV. You know, they'll, say, they'll, say, uh, they'll say objection. Right. Right. Are there, is that going to happen during this deposition? I guarantee you I will at least object to satisfy your image of me on TV. Okay. okay? <laughs> well, but, what, hap what happens if that takes place? Do I still have to answer the question? or you, d you do have to answer the question, but I would say if you hear me say uh, objection, shut up. Quiet. Listen closely to what I say in the objection, because it may be objection. That question has already been asked and has already been answered. Then I have to sit back, and then you would, could probably say something like, can you repeat that question again? Because between the dialogue between the attorney and I, and he may give me or she may give me a dirty look, or I may give him or her a pleasant look, um, you know, you just kind of, you're not part of that show. There's a lot of things in wizard world between those two wizards. Don't try to pretend to understand what's happening by body language or words. Just stay control, okay? But I may say things like, not relevant. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm talking to the judge who's in the court reporter's box. And I want the judge to rule on certain questions that cannot be used later because he then has to go through all the objections and say, 
yeah, that's going in. Oh, that's a proper objection. If I were there, I would have said you can't answer that type of thing. But I cannot instruct you because you're not my client. I cannot instruct you not to answer a question. If you were my client, then I could certainly intervene on attorney-client privilege and things like that. So great question. You're going to be good at this, I can tell. <laughs> I brought along some materials that I'm not sure you had a chance to read, uh, one of which is a report that I had a meeting um, prior to the lawsuit getting started uh, from the family medicine doctor that gave a pretty good history of Jack, um, you know, his weight, his age, prior history, uh, been a long-term family doctor, and uh, uh, as I'm talking, and if you have not had a chance to read it while you're out skiing, it might be a good idea to just kind of breeze through that. So we're not going to get into the specifics, but the next section of this is going to be the deposition of the insurance attorney, and I'm pretty sure they're going to be kind of poking some things in there, so feel free to read that and ignore me as I kind of roll through a few things, right? Uh, I've got some slides up there, but I don't want you to look at them there, but I'm going to give you this so you can kind of, well, you can read, your, read, read the report, just relax, okay? So the first thing I want you to do is to always remember in this process to breathe. Particularly if you're new and this is an unfamiliar thing, you've got to remember that oxygen and the brain, they got something to do with cognition and awareness and function and multitasking. So breath is a really, really important thing and it's underrepresented, I think, in uh, trial advocacy issues for attorneys and doctors, just breathing. If you look at me at any point in time and I'm like, I'm like the third base coach giving you like, hey man, you're looking a little red up here, you're, you're getting a little too tight, I'm seeing the veins coming out, you know, I want you to breathe, okay? When you come in, I want you to dress professionally. I don't want you coming in like you're gonna come into a funeral or getting married or anything like that. You're going to a professional meeting, you want to wear a tie, you don't want to wear a tie, it's good, but sport jacket's nice. What's really cool is if you're coming in from the OR and you're coming in on your scrubs, man, that's, that's, that's like TV stuff. That's good, right? Um, I think in, in terms of level of preparation, it's always a good idea <clears throat> to not have to revert, you know, refer to your file, the patient's Jack's file, um, just occasionally. It's good to have your whatever you have documents there. Remember, anything that you have that you bring, the other side gets entitled to a copy. So if you've got little cheat notes in there, it's, they're going to get copies of it. So make sure you know your file and, and bring in what, uh, what's part of the file. Um, it's always good in preparation as you're reading things to um, you know, think about things that generate concern for you that you want to go over. That's what this meeting is about. So um, I want you to be prepared for some of the questions. And I know you're probably already thought about this, but I'm just going to throw out a couple that I think are really important things that the dark forces are going to jump on. And the first one is going to be around pre-existing conditions because we know Jack's 53 years old. Um, he is not a spring chicken. Um, he's had some neck and back stuff intermittently over time. Uh, he's been seeing a chiropractor, you know, once a month. Um, um, so there's some issues there that are, are ripe for discussions. And, but we need to kind of understand how that fits into a medical legal, which is very different than how they fit into a, a surgeon's point of view or a family doctor's point of view. By the way, the family doctor is pretty smart. They really seem to have grasped the essence of medical legal pre-existing conditions and, and how that report was drafted. So as we go through this, remember that the insurance company attorney is a wizard as good as me, if not better. And, um, and they're going to be taking the position from their mindset, two things. One, they're going to say the cause of the present pain, the symptoms and treatment needs are not from the current trauma, but rather from a pre-existing injury, symptoms or treatment. And, and as a result, we don't pay for that stuff. That's their position. If it's pre-existing, it's not related, we don't pay. And they're going to use something out of medicine not out of medical legal concepts, but out of pure medicine, kind of a simple question. Doctor, would you agree with me that um, Jack's prior neck and back condition, his age, his weight, his, his occupation, has something to do with what's going on post-trauma? And you as a doctor, as a muggle, are going to simply say, yeah, absolutely, I agree with that, because all doctors would say that, all chiropractors would say that, all physical therapists would say that, all massage therapists, all acupuncturists, all naturopaths, all the mindset around that is it's one body, 
cause and effect is, you know, it's all in there. It's more of a gestalt approach in medicine. Um, however, we're not in medical school. We're not in a mentor relationship with, uh, with a professor or a trainer. We are in a wizard world. And here's what's going to happen. You are going to become this wizard that they need you to be, Jack needs you to be, to understand a very simple concept. The concept is pre-existing conditions. There are two types in our world, only one in your world. There's two in ours. We have created this fiction called inactive pre-existing condition and active pre-existing condition. And the first rule to understand is that um, when you're getting into that, when they're getting into those questions, you need to put on your wizard hat and begin thinking, okay, here come the questions about uh, what's related and what's not, but we're gonna, I'm gonna give you the overlay on how you, how you explain that. If somebody has an active pre-existing condition, it means at the time of the trauma, they're having symptoms and or treatment, and trauma superimposed on that, lights it up and makes it worse, and then you have to apportion how much is old and new. But if somebody has a pre-existing condition and it's dormant and it's smoldering along and trauma is superimposed on that, then 100% of everything comes from that traumatic event, even though they had pre-existing degenerative disc disease, degenerative joint disease, pre-existing chiropractic care, treatment with a family doctor, whatever it is. Here's a couple of cases I pulled out that I thought you might find interesting. I found they're interesting, and particularly this particular case, Ben versus Messick, is a, uh, a court case from the Washington Supreme Court back in 1969. It's a fun case because there's this guy Bennett over in Yakima, he's a fruit picker, and there's this guy Messick who is around six o'clock, has had about four or five beers already, and he's driving a forklift, and he's a little bit pissed off at Bennett for something that happened the day before, and he's trying to run him over. Uh, in, in the apple orchards, and he catches up to him, and he, he catches his ankle, and he, 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 he hurts him. Um, and anyway, there's a claim um, that comes out of that because of the, the injury, and it turns out that um, our friend uh, Bennett, the fruit picker, had this ankle injury from playing basketball 40 years earlier. Uh, well, when it came time to kind of resolve the case, the at-fault party's insurance company said, well, he had a pre-existing condition, but for the pre-existing condition, this ankle injury wouldn't have been as bad. It's really the old stuff that's causing the problem, not the new stuff. However, the family doctor and the surgeon in that case said, yeah, um, you know, um, the prior, uh, the pre-existing condition was not active. He was not symptomatic. He was working as a fruit picker. It wasn't that big of a problem. It's really the trauma plus that that kind of aggravated. Case went all the way up from trial, Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court. It took many years. And the court came out with this, with this uh, opinion, which I share with the, our audience on TV. Uh, the rule is that when a latent condition itself does not cause pain, suffering, or disability, but that condition plus an injury brings on pain or disability by aggravating the pre-existing condition and making it active, then the injury and not the pre-existing condition is the proximate cause of the pain and disability Thus, the party at fault is held for the entire damages as a direct result of that accident. That's where the wizards on the Supreme Court are. We, we took that and we're now saying there's two types of pre-existing conditions. We've got to look at active and inactive. If it's active, then we have to apportion. 90-10, 50-50, 60-40, 40-60. There's another pretty cool case that I brought along um, called Harris versus Drake. It's a case 40 years oh, only uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, um, Mr. Harris versus Mrs. Drake. So Doris Drake rear ends Mr. Harris. Um, Harris is a painter. Uh, he has symptoms of back pain and he has shoulder pain. Uh, he has a shoulder MRI because of the pain he's having about a month post-collision, but it's negative. Nothing showing up on the MRI, at least according to the radiologist because surgeons might read those MRIs and physiatrists might read those MRIs being somewhat different. Harris returns to work. He's off work for a few weeks. His shoulder gets really, really sore, really symptomatic, really problematic, goes back to the doctor. It turns out he's never had shoulder problems ever before in his life, although he's a painter and everybody says, well, occupational hazard, maybe it's not from the collision, maybe it's coming from his occupation. They try to settle the case um, 
And uh, Drake's attorneys, which were all state, uh, turned down an offer of settlement. The case went to trial, and then Harris got an award from the jury more than Doris's Drake insurance policy coverage, which now put the insurance company on the hook. Drake appeals. Drake loses. And here's why they lost. Supreme Court, 40 years after the Bennett case, says, even allowing for the possibility of a pre-existing condition, the defense failed to show that such condition was symptomatic prior to the accident. When an accident lights, lights up and makes active a pre-existing condition that was dormant and asymptomatic immediately prior to the accident, the pre-existing condition is not a proximate cause of the resulting damages. So they're going to be talking a lot about his prior history. The question really is, was his condition active or inactive? And so if they ask you the question, doctor, do you agree with me or something like that, uh, that um, his old condition and a or, or intermittent condition uh, with the trauma now leads to where he's at now? And you have to say, well, um, his condition, my understanding, was inactive or smoldering or mild, under control or fixed and stable. And the trauma is really the cause because he didn't have leg pain. He didn't have uh, disabling pain. Uh, everything he had was, before was mild. Now we're moderate, severe. So kind of a, a real change in circumstances to kind of say the, the, the cause and effect. The other thing that, you know, I know that you are, you have a, I just saw your pager go off, so you're going to be needing to leave soon, but I want to just leave you with one more concept that I find that newer doctors, as well as experienced ones, I can tell you the experienced ones think they know everything, and boy, you just got to unwind them. It's not easy, so don't do that. Don't become that person. Be open, fluid, wizard-like, okay? Um, and that, that really is the standard by which we testify under oath in court. Wizards have a very different standard than doctors. In fact, I heard this very talented surgeon the other day who does this robotic stuff down in the Olympia area. He's given me a presentation after presentation about 96% and only 4% errors and 99%. And, and you, got, you guys deal in these 90 percentiles as being like factual stuff. And even then, people throw darts at you. In our world, that's like unheard of to be at 90% accurate on anything. That's why we're attorneys. Um, <laughs> we deal in probabilities. We deal in possibilities, not in absolutes. So one of the things that you always need to remember is that when you are testifying, you're always testifying, whatever opinion you get, it's on a more probable than not basis. And there's substitute language, like the courts say, to a reasonable medical certainty. And that word certainty puts you into that presentation by that very talented surgeon the other day, about 90 percentile certainty. If you look up the source, there's kind of that, that, that overlap. We're just talking about 51%. Uh, something that I've shared with uh, people uh, in the audience before is to think about your um, you know, educational system that you've been through, elementary, middle, high school, college, graduate schools, and you're graded on this A, B, C, D scale. A is 90% and above, B is 80 to 89, C, 70 to 79, D, 60 to 69, F, under 60, and you know, note to the parent or note from the dean, and you're on your way out. But in law, we want you to give a F opinion. That's the standard. 51% is an F-rated opinion, but here's the key for, for being a wizard. You just have to be 100% certain of your 51% opinion, <laughs> and you're rock solid gold, you're going into the Hall of Fame, you become an immediate wizard, those two things, pre-existing conditions and the standard by which you give opinions. Um, and it's also important to breathe answer the question. And uh, I think I have one more minute here, Mitchie, right? There's a couple things for the, our, our friends. Um, don't get angry with the other attorney, even if they try to. Remember, they're trying to do things to see what is you're going to look like when you go to court. Um, they can come in and be drama majors in college and now become attorneys, and they try to use those dramatic skills uh, against you to see where your hot buttons are. 
And all they're doing is just taking notes, like if this case goes to trial, I know his hot button and I know how to get to it. So just kind of always breathe, be cool and calm. If you don't understand the question, you have total power to say, I'm not sure I understand it. Could you explain it? Don't guess what they're trying to do. And, um, and just talk to, talk to the person asking, I'm not there. I've had uh, a, one funny case I'll tell you about where um, it was, uh, they requested a videotape deposition of the doctor because they wanted to freeze his testimony. And um, then there was a break, but the camera was still on. And the defense attorney went to the restroom. And as he was going out to the restroom, he looks at me and he winks. And it's on camera. That's not good. And the defense attorney didn't know about it until he looked at the video. And he's like, what's the winking going on? So that was what the whole trial testimony was, was my relationship with the doctor and why he was winking at me. And, and he's, was that you winking? Why were you winking? I don't know. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, so there are things like that. Just keep, keep eye contact with him. And after the deposition, do not high five me. Don't pound me. Don't explosion me. Don't pat me on the back. Don't ask me in front of the court reporter, how do I do? None of that. Professional, you leave. I leave. Call me. I can call you. We just kind of keep it professional and above board. Any questions? No, I think you've covered it all. Great, great. So um, thank you again for, for meeting me and making time. I know you got to answer that pager, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be right back. So that was kind of a, a very short, abbreviated prep session. <laughs> now the real stuff begins. Question, or uh, where's Scott? Are we on the program? We have time for a question? Oh, there you are. Or do we want to hold those till the next moment? Whatever you want. I, I guess I got the free ride this year. I'm, I'm the microphone hander out here. I will do a quick question. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Adler, that was amazing. Uh, like last year, your sessions were just amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and uh, I think as, uh, as physicians and neurosurgeons, we get caught in these, caught, I say caught, in these things where we feel very uncomfortable, very unprepared. Muggle. And I want, <laughs> right, muggle world. W would you be willing to share some of those slides? Because some of your summaries of those cases yeah. and your little bullet points at the end, I mean, I would love to have that that I could look at before every deposition meeting of any kind, whether it's personal injury or not. Um, those are just amazing sort of bullet points, ABCs. Wow. So I don't know if you'd be willing to share that. Yeah, in fact, you can go to our web page and there's articles upon articles of other cases on pre-existing conditions and testimony in adlergearsh.com. And um, there's a resource page. You, there's books and articles. We do a lot of that stuff. But Michi will make that available. Um, so yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Other, by the way, other attorneys have been known to go to his page to uh, get information too. Great. Any other questions? So now we have, um, I have the pleasure to introduce one of my law partners. Um, there were five of us, by the way, in the, in the law firm, and a total of 20 people overall, but five, uh, five attorneys are all partners. Uh, the next one is uh, going to be Steve Anglis. Steve is an attorney that used to work on the dark side of the force. He used to work for Progressive Insurance Company. And uh, he was a trial attorney for them. And he and Flo had kind of a disagreement on some things. <laughs> and uh, you know, he needed to leave the house and uh, find his way uh, out in the world without Flo. And, uh, but Steve is doing amazing work. He is a Jedi Knight, a wizard. Uh, and Steve has uh, uh, graciously agreed to take on the role of being the insurance defense attorney. And he's now going to take his deposition, now that he's been prepared, based upon the case hypothetical and based upon the family doctor's report. Um, so Steve, um, are you, you want this mic, that mic? No, okay, this I'll, one. I'll Thank turn you. turn this off, and then I'll come back again. Or Scott, you're going to come back on for some questions after this deposition session.